Fanfare, fanfare, fanfare. <laughs> fanfare, 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 fanfare. Mucho grandios, fanfare. Woo! Wee! That's the theme song for the Golden Age podcast. Look how relevant we are with our production values. It's the Golden Age podcast. Live and in effect from Erie, Pennsylvania. And today, we're coming in live from space. We're visiting you from the Martian Corridor, a.k.a. the Lake Erie Pacific, or the northwest of the eastern seaboard of the United States. And we're here to do a perfectly imperfect podcast. This is going to be episode two of the podcast. We're officially official, like a referee with a whistle. I hope my levels are good. I seem to have been peaking a little bit at the, there at the beginning. So we are going to gracefully fade out our incredible Pleiadian theme tunes. So ever so gently, ever so gently fading out. All right. There it is. That sounded way more professional than me just going fanfare, fanfare, and then going, there's your intro. You like it. And just to passive aggressively just foist my intro on you without any pre thought. But that was our, our test run, remember, guys? Um, anywho, welcome to the Golden Age podcast. It's not really a podcast, it's more of a broadcast. Sometimes I sing that, sometimes I don't, but it's up to me. That's how this works. I want you to know that uh, that there's a distinct possibility that I do have friends and contemporaries and individuals uh, here in Erie, Pennsylvania, who have already earned uh, my uh, love and respect and have already uh, earned uh, mine in return. One of those human beings is um, an individual who's been in comedy longer than really anybody in Erie's been in comedy. I'm going to go on the record and say uh, this might be the uh, elder statesman of the uh, Erie comedy scene. I hope that's not too much of a stretch here. but I'm blushing. Uh, please welcome to the uh, the Udio, none other than Scotty G. Scotty G Live is in the house. BJ, thanks, brother. Happy to be here. It's actually uh, my first ever podcast, so I'm like uh, branching out into uh, social media and other medias. We're just... Uh, we're just uh, showing our greenhorns, huh? Exactly. Here, let me reach behind your ears. Oh, soaking wet. <laughs> oh, wee! Soaking wet behind this guy's <laughs> ears. Uh, here I am, a seasoned veteran of the, the podcasting world after uh, exactly one 1. 1.5 hour episode. So <laughs> now I can afford to throw my weight around. Exactly. So, it's all yeah, good. let me tell you how you do a podcast. Well, see, it's brand new. Like the, the template is wide open because what's a podcast? That's what everyone needs to understand. Well, podcast is a podcast 6.0. Exactly. But well, we're kind of like two peas in a pod, so it's the two peas in a podcast. Two peas in a pod. Two pe- <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you got to stay on brand here, Scotty. Like we got two peas in a pod. So like just to, to let you know what we're doing, um, we've already built a few traditions here uh, on right. the Golden Age podcast. Um, there's certain phrases we like to say. Well, the first thing we say is, uh, I'm going to make a sound effect that says, uh, small talk sucks. Okay. Small talk sucks. Small talk sucks. This little button. As soon as somebody starts like, well, the weather this this week has been. Small talk sucks. Small talk sucks. Or like Whee! the, you know, remember in um, <laughs> Family Feud? Yep, yep. When they. Um, buzz them out. They get the buzzer. Survey says. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. And then small talk sucks. So small talk sucks. I mean, that goes without saying. Exactly. And then I guess, uh, I guess part two of that would also be gossip sucks, maybe. Right. By the way, if you're really, really short, would small talk still suck if you're like only four foot ten or something? If you're if you're a midget, my mom's like four if foot If you're 11, a midget yeah. or a little person, small talk is even shittier. It's worse because you're small. It's small talk doing. Small talk, yeah, yeah, it's extra small. That's true. Okay, all right. Yeah, that's <laughs> like especially like my friend. Like I have a, a little, little person uh, skater slash comedian, Poncho Moller. Shout out to Poncho Moller. Shout out to Poncho. Um, when Poncho does small talk. Yeah. That shit is minuscule. It's minuscule, is it really? Jeez. I mean, that makes it smaller. <laughs> so we don't like small. Well, yeah, small talk sucks and gossip sucks. So, you know, exactly. if you're not in the exactly. room to defend yourself, let's, uh, you know, we can laud them. We can compliment mm-hmm. humans. Hey, if you can't say it to their face, don't say it, right? 
Yeah, but we, we can say nice shit to the. Uh, oh yeah, if, if you wouldn't say something to we someone's face, we can say face, nice shit. Right, don't say it behind their back. We, right? we, we this can, is nice, right? You were saying, hey, PJ's like a great guy. He he cares about people. He just wants to do the right thing. That's okay. That's yeah. great gossip. That's, that's not even gossip. gossip. That's that's yeah. That's spreading can we, love. Can we yeah. come up with a new word like good gossip? Good is there, gossip. Can, yeah. we, let's, can we workshop that? We're just spreading the love. We're spreading the love. Yeah. You know? Instead of spread gossip, love. Yeah. it'll be I don't know, awesome, like awesome gossip. Yeah, awesip. Aus- 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 oh shit! I don't know. <laughs> and then, uh, then the other thing we have a phrase. I have a, a, a tagline. It's like my dad used to say, like he wouldn't, he didn't want to curse. You know, right. he didn't want to be a bad influence on the kids. So he'd right. say, if uh, if he wanted you to go fuck off, right. he'd say, just you go jump in the lake. Oh, I like it. He tells you to go jump in the lake. I had one of those for my son. The tagline. Mine was mother puss bucket. Remember where that was from? What was that from? From Ghostbusters. First Ghostbusters. I love oh. Bill Murray. He was, uh, when Stay Puft Marshmallow Man was walking down the street and they're on top of the building, he's like, Mother Puss Bucket. And I just picked wow. up that line and my ex wife, she was like, Will you stop saying that? That's gross. I'm like, It's Bill Murray. It's Ghostbusters. It's a bucket of pus. Come on. Yeah, Mother Puss Bucket. No, that's, yeah. that's a throw. And I, I don't want to say throwaway line, but that's a line that never, I never like registered that, you right. know? And so, like, that's the funny thing about comedy is like when you start thinking about it, like it's like the weird, small, subtle things that make right. you like gut laugh. Like, you know, like that punch in the gut laugh. Exactly. Yeah. Like, like I watch The Office and I want to like go in from the first season. I just want to like mark, like write down every moment that like punched me right in the gut. Like, right, you know? right. And sometimes it's just somebody walking into a wall or Pratt fall. Like people of the world, why, why is falling down so funny? Do you, can you can we address this? For a sick society, I think. Yeah, I, I don't know. Because, like, I am a klutz. So I fall at home and trip. My family would be, first they would initially go, are you okay? And once I said, yeah, they'd just crack up laughing. I don't know why it's so funny. It's just slapstick. People, we have Charlie Chaplin and all the slapstick from the old days. Yeah, that's them. what I was going to say. Like, yeah. uh, uh, you know, Chaplin, uh, Buster Keaton. Three Stooges. You know, when I moved to L.A., I really started studying, like, the history of film and the silent films especially. Oh, that's cool. Um, that's really cool. And uh, maybe, I mean, I would, as much as I would love to be a good stand-up comic or one-liner type of comic, I think I'd rather be a physical comic. More, It might be a little too late for me, but <laughs> I just love the idea of physical comedy, and I, I think it's a part of comedy that's really slept on. That, you no, know, no reason you can't do both. I have... Um, I worked with a comic down in Pittsburgh, Howard Mincone. Okay, a very kind of like a magician comedian. He's a very funny guy, and he did some physical humor with the one-liners, and it worked really well. No reason you can't do both. Yeah, I'm just I'm trying to figure out a way to incorporate everything. Um, you know, whenever I talk to somebody, like you know, I'm 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 going out to do this, like. Well, who are your biggest influences? And like, that's a really tough thing to answer. But yeah. I'll give you an opportunity to answer that first, okay. and then I'll tell you who I I feel like my if you if you could wrap I guess four to five people into a box and make it you mm-hmm. like. So it's and part of my problem. I was doing comedy on and off since 1989. Since maybe most of your listeners weren't even born yet, I started the Funny Bone in Cincinnati. But I, hey, you don't know the age demographic of my listeners. <laughs> that's right. true. That's How a good point. You age I just like to say assume. I'm old. I just like to point out that I'm old. But anyway. we can't help it when we were plopped here. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Anyway, so yeah. my thing was I grew up with the '80s comics. So nothing offends me. I grew up in Jersey. Nothing offends me. I don't find anything too dirty. You know, my point is you can say anything to me, and if I don't like it, I don't like it. I don't get offended though. Right. You know, so my influences, I mean, uh, I have so many. I, if I had to rank them, Eddie Murphy was probably number one because he could he can do comedy, he could act, and he can sing. He was an entertainer, I like to call it, not just a comedian, entertainer. And I, I, that's what I want to be. I, I've acted, I've been the lead in school plays, I was a drummer, I was a singer in a band. You know, musician, say per, should say percussionist, because I played all types of percussion. Yeah, me too. In orchestras, yeah. So, um, so I'm a musician, comedian, and I've done acting too. So Eddie was big. I did love Roddy Dangerfield. In fact, my comedy character that I finally discovered after doing comedy for thirty years, <laughs> the last five years, has been, uh, you know, my character was built partially off of the the you know Roddy's. I don't. 
I don't get no respect. So a lot of my jokes and my act are built around how I don't feel the love. Similar, not different. It's a totally different, uh, you know, type of joke than Rodney does. But that definitely influenced my character, Rodney Dangerfield. I loved Robin Williams. I just my look doesn't give itself to wild and crazy like him. But I love his wild, crazy, all over the place. Um, you know, one-liners and, and obscure references. Um, Bill Murray, of course, uh, I, you know, is him in acting and comedic acting was always good. So that's he has, four. A, great, he has a great deadpan, something yeah. about Bill, like something really funny about somebody who can just tell a joke with a straight face and you're losing yeah. your mind and you're just standing there with a straight face. And exactly. I think that's the appeal of Bill. And actually, speaking of another comic, I don't know if you know from the 80s, Stephen Wright. He oh, yeah. totally have no emotion and... I just he was hysterical. He could deadpan all these lines, and yep. it worked. Yeah. Gr growing up, Stephen Wright was definitely. Uh, I remember watching stuff on HBO. We were poor, so we could hardly afford it. But when we did, we would watch all the comedy, and we loved my mom. We lo loved exposing us to Stephen Wright and and uh, Robin Williams. They didn't care for Roseanne so much. <laughs> yeah. But, I, uh, I actually didn't watch Roseanne either. Yeah. But pe people don't give Roseanne enough credit for doing it. You know, even in the early early mid 80s oh yeah she was no she was a, a great being a comedian. pioneer um and i get you know, i give her credit too when she you know if right or wrong when she got kicked off her show and you know we i'm not going to debate the right or wrong of that i didn't like that she got kicked off i thought she was a very good human being and saying just kill me off and let the rest of the actors and actresses continue the show without me so they aren't out of work i thought that was a high class move by her you know, I think she's a high class all the way. Um, you know, she's not afraid to speak, speak truth to power. Uh, I don't always agree with all of her stuff, but, you know, I'm a huge uh, fan of um, her as a, as, as a stand up act. And then what she did on the show uh, to just sort of, you know, uh, encourage equality and just be like the, the working person, like the blue collar, yeah. the bl vo voice of the working, working poor. Uh, which is really needed, I think, in the time time frame that it, that it was out. So, uh, any other influences you can think of? Or well, uh, since we brought Roseanne Barr, I mean, there were some female comedians too. I love Rita Rudner. I love Elaine Boozler, Lily Tomlin, because also oh an God. actress. But um, I saw some of her shows young, when younger in New York City. Where, um, like, one of my favorite Lily Tomlin jokes is that you know, you you're walking down the street in New York City and you see all these people just talking to themselves all over the city. Wouldn't it be nice if we can pair them up so at least it looks like they're having a conversation? <laughs> I just I killed me that joke. But yeah, yeah a little reminded, Tomlin too. Yeah. Every time I see people with their Bluetooths talking on their phones, it reminds me of that that bit because yep. I'm just like, are they really talking to somebody or did they just stick a twig in their ear so they they didn't have to sound you know look appear schizophrenic any longer? Exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I I, I made an uh, observation about the schizophrenics the other day. It's like, oh, we're always talking shit about schizophrenics. Like, oh, you're the crazy one. It's like, hey, uh, uh, I, th I think they might. I think they might be monitoring us. You know, like they're uh, monitoring our conversation. They might. They might be trying to. They might be trying. They might be actually trying to kill us, guys. Right. Like, you <laughs> fucking nut! Look at this guy, paranoid. For, and the difference between them and us normies is that we know that's true. Right, right. We right. just don't care. Exactly. It's like, yeah, they're trying to kill us. Here, have another Snickers bar. But then, like. Right. Who's the crazier one, us or them? They're like, yeah. how come nobody's getting as worked up about this as I am, man? Like, it's because we're apathetic, right? Right, like, right. Maybe they're more in touch than we are, huh? Oh, I know. It may be. <laughs> so, um, so I mean, I, I, there's so many comedians I didn't name. But I don't want to go on on the whole oh, podcast. Oh, go on. We're, it's a podcast. It's yeah, open but, I mean, I, I love Sam Kinison, but I'll tell you the one comedian that you may, people may not know, because the last time I spoke to him, he was only doing cruise ships and corporate events like in Vegas. Huh. Um, and it, the reason I bring him up is, you know, I, you know, I, I started in my 20s in 1989, Funny Bone in Cincinnati, open mic nights. And I was trying to do a new seven minutes of material every two weeks. We got mm. two, they let us do two open mics a month. That's a tall order. And, it, and I, I failed. I, my first show was still maybe my funniest show. Where my first seven minutes was comedy gold. It was Valentine's Day, 1989, February 14th. I had the right seven minutes for a room full of people on valentine's day romantic half Dinner, drunk and they killed it right <laughs> killed it and then i like for six months after i almost didn't get a laugh i hardly got laughs because yep. i was trying all this new seven minutes it just didn't work but uh, uh a couple decades later when i was you know doing juniors here in erie pennsylvania or any club i would if i'm you know, an MC or I was opening, 
I would go to the headliner and I'd say, what did you think of my act? And what's funny, obviously, there's, this is tens and tens and hundreds of comedians. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to name any names or throw anyone under the bus, but I go to a headliner and it, a lot of them would say, what did you think about my act? They, I said, what'd you think about Mike? Well, what'd you think about mine? It, they, no one ever critiqued me. Yeah. They would always, they were more concerned about, well, what did I think? They were funny. What did I think of their acting? Like, you're a Larry. You're the headliner. Two way street. Here. Yeah, you're the headliner. How about me? Yeah. But, the, but the reason I mentioned this comic, Bud Anderson's his name, he was actually in an Adam Sandler movie uh, also. Um, I think it was Happy Gilmore. It was, yeah. It, it was Billy Madison. I think it was Happy Gilmore. It was Bud was in that movie. Anyway, um, Bud Anderson came to Erie, Pennsylvania, and I was opening for him. It was a charity show for uh, my son's school and for the March of Dimes, a charity I've been on the board of for uh, you know over 20 years and been involved with for Very nice. over 40. Yeah, I love the March of Dimes. Great cause. We can yeah. talk about them later. But I asked Bud after the show. Bud is, Bud is a very intelligent man. He has seven college degrees. Wow. So And he does stand-up comedy. He is very well at it. Um, again, he gets paid well on the cruise ships. He gets paid well at the corporate events. He doesn't even do clubs anymore. He doesn't need Who to. Who needs to, yeah. Right. But he sat, I said to him after the show, I said, Bud, what did you think of my act? And uh, we've been doing it literally for almost 20 years, right? He says, you don't know how to structure a comedy act. So I've written so I've written lyrics for over 70 songs. I was in a band growing up. So I know how to structure a song, right? Yeah. I didn't know how to structure a comedy act. He sat me down at the bar at Junior's here in Erie, Pennsylvania, between the shows. It was a Friday night, so we're doing you know, d- double show there. Had you know an hour between shows. And I always have my acts on paper. I never read. I memorize them. But I make sometimes I'll make notes on it before the show or after the show. Yeah, back up a little bit. Oh, back okay. yeah, Just, a, just about a fist show. distance. There you go. Sorry. Gotcha. Too close to the mic. Anyways. I'm just looking at the at the soundboard just to make sure we're, we're blowing up good. people's ears. Huh? No, no, you're good. <laughs> anyway, so we, uh, we sat down at the bar. I pulled out my piece of paper with my seven minute act on it, right? Because I was emceeing that night for the charity event, and he said, "Here's how you do it." And he boom, he rewrote my act, not just the same jokes, wow. but he reorganized it. And he says, "What you got to do is a third." The first third of your act. So if you have a six-minute act, two minutes. If you have a 30-minute act, 10 minutes. The first third of your act, at least five to seven minutes if you're headlining, you should be telling the audience who you are. Yep, introduce and yourself. Like I'm half Italian, quarter German, quarter Irish. I, I hope you guys are listening. Jersey. I hope everyone out here is listening because right now you're getting a primer. You're getting a master class. Exactly. This guy's <laughs> done done the homework. So you'd be wise if you're in the comedy world to, to listen to how you format your comedy. And there there is a, a method to the madness. Yeah, and I appreciate that love because I, I've taken the Steve Martin master class. I've read the comedy book written by comedy coach Steve North and uh, this Bud Anderson impromptu class. He basically said the first 30 you act, get the audience to know who you are. I grew up on the ocean in Jersey. Here's my, my authenticity. Here's this. And then they can, if, if someone says, oh, I'm also half Italian. Oh, I grew up on the ocean somewhere. I'm from Jersey too. Yeah. I'm from New York City. Then when you do your other jokes, they feel like they have a connection with you. They can relate to you. It's like Johnny you. Carson said. If they like you, they're going to laugh at you. Exactly right. Yeah. So you have to get the audience. You have to pull them in in the first third of your act to get them to know who you are. Get on your side. And then you almost any any decent joke will work. Yes. And he was right. I, be, I became much much funnier after he taught me how to structure an act. They know who you are now, and now you've established yourself as a character. It's like in a movie, you know, there's opening scenes where they're establishing characters. Like one of my favorite movies is called The Lady Killers, written by yep. the Coen yep. brothers, right? Yep. And in the beginning, they're introducing the characters, but you kind of don't realize they're introducing the characters. They're just running these, like, random vignettes right. that are introducing the characters that you see. But, but before you have the context, you're just like, well, here's, like, they're trying to rob the donut shop, and yeah. then, like, it's a movie set and they, they they kill a dog by putting a gas mask on it right. and it's like they're introducing the characters and then they all assemble but that's the beauty of introducing in any movie you know uh you get that backstory and you have to flesh that out so that you give a shit about what you're about to watch exactly right yeah and you know it's funny is i i uh, here in erie when they brought me out of retirement I was actually retired for 10 years because of my job uh and doing this comedy um which is funny because I headlined a show and then I retired. <laughs> I did my first headline show in 2008. And I'm out. And then, and then because it was, it was actually, I'm, again, I'm not going to talk negative. Basically, it's because of my job. 
um, my job in doing comedy did not mix. And then 10 years later, when I, my job in comedy could mix, um, a local establishment, Room 33 here in Erie, brought me out of retirement. They told shout me. out to Room 33. Oh, yeah, shout their, out to Room 33. Their chef, Sam, is one of the best chefs. Their food is incredible. Their cocktails are the class, way too classy for Erie, Pennsylvania. <laughs> exactly. And it's probably the best chill venue to go and enjoy a good time. So I'm going to be trying to weasel my way into there. You got it. Well, the um, original owners, Rob and Rebecca, pulled me out of retirement. Now the current owners, Sean and Lizzie, are like family. And uh, they I run the, they let me run the comedy show there. I can do what I need to to do shows. Please make sure you get me some FaceTime with them. I will. Uh, I, I want to come bring my, my record player and just spend old 45s during dinner time or something like that. Just okay. dress vintage and do that whole presentation. So Well, you might, have to, you might have to do a couple minutes for me for my next show there. You're going to have to go up on stage. <laughs> hey, man, I'm happy to do it. Any venue that, that, that wants to have us come out and uh, make fools out of ourselves is, is welcome to. So anyone out there, if you're feeling the vibe here, you're feeling the chemistry, you're like, these dudes, let's get them on stage. Let's... Let's make a, help. Let them make us some like crack to slap right. our asses. Get back on the corner. Exactly, and that's. But when they brought me out of retirement, because of my experience to run the open mic night, I would do a class before the show, a couple of days before the show, so we can work on material. Because what Roger Naylor, he was another influence I didn't mention. He, a lot of people may not know Roger. He was a popular DJ in Cincinnati, Ohio, in the late eighties, early nineties. Also a stand-up comic, traveled the country, and an author. He's written some books. He slapped the sass out of the 20-year-old Scotty J. So when I when I started doing comedy there and asked him for advice, he was like, you can't do that show at the early, that joke at the early dinner show. I'm like, why not? It killed at the late show. <laughs> and he's like, he's like he, he wouldn't even debate me. He would just be like, listen, I don't have time for this. I told you. You want it, feedback. I'm giving you feedback. If you don't want to take it, I don't care. He's like, but don't if you do that joke early show on Saturday night with the older crowd, you're not going to get any work. You'll walk the room maybe. Yeah. yeah. yeah he said, so take it or leave it. He'd walk away from me. There you go. And you know what? Cause I was that young kid from New Jersey who in Jersey, you, you don't back down. You debate everything. Why you're defensive. Yeah. I grew up learning to be defensive and I had to learn not to be defensive in the comedy world. Take oh. the advice because he was just trying to help me. Can you tell this to my buddy from Wildwood? Again, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Kevin Purcell. Shout out to Wildwood, KP. New Jersey, right? He's from Wildwood. I yeah. spent every summer there. My grandpa took me there every summer. Wildwood, New Jersey, growing up. So you Love guys Wildwood. don't you guys don't know Kevin Purcell, but I'm gonna do like my impression of Kevin Purcell. Like, hey guys, what up? What up? I'm Kevin. What up, guys? <laughs> we're, we're 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 gonna play this. We're gonna play next set. Uh, we got some got some good tunes coming up. First, we gotta go smoke a joint over in the corner there. Yeah. He's, a, he's the, the lead guy for the Superfly crew. That's my twin brother's uh, nice. rap metal band that he was in in the 90s. <laughs> nice. So my brother uh, was a progenitor of rap metal in the uh, mid early mid-90s, or mid-90s, mid-late 90s. He had a rap metal band that was getting local radio airplay in Tampa. And I just told him, like, why don't you re-release all your stuff? Like, rap metal's making a huge resurgence, you know? Right. You just take your hat, you put it on at about a 30-degree angle, boom, you're back in 93, 90, 94. Like, exactly, yeah. You know, so <laughs> shout-out to rap metal, shout-out to the Superfly crew, and shout-out to my brother, uh, Chris Cody. He's been uh, sending me AI-generated images so that we can go to hell together uh, that I've been uh, <laughs> utilizing for some of my designs. Anyone out there listening, if you want a sticker, I've made up some stickers. And anybody interested in a sticker, <laughs> you just email me, CodyGalaxy at gmail.com. Like, I want a sticker. A sticker. And I will slap some decals upon your face. Hey, but the Chris and Kevin to all the rap metal, you know, people out there. Hey, the Scotty G. Wee! You get my wee. That's 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 the, uh, the trademark, all right? Yeah, so my trademark. Mark it. Can I, can I try? I can tell you a story later, but go Can on. I try? Yeah, go it. Wee! That's it. You got it. Wee! <laughs> so if you're from the South, you know how you do that? How? Hoy. <laughs> You'd put the ha huh in front of the wa. <laughs> like like when, when I, Southern gentlemen, there's certain things that really me. trigger me when people talk. Like right. if, a, if a Southern person doesn't hear you very well, he'll go, do what? Yeah, yeah. He'll go, do what? Do what? I'm not, not doing anything. I'm actually telling you something. Or when somebody goes, I'll tell, ask somebody a phone number. It's it's going to be 860. Like, what do you mean it's going to be? Like, yeah. is it is it a future it is, number? Or is it, is yeah. it currently 860? <laughs> Yeah, it's gonna be four or five in the future when you emerge from your time machine. Right. <laughs> exactly. So certain like turns of phrase that like trigger me for something. Do they drive a DeLorean? Is Do that? what? Yeah. Do what? Do what? 
<laughs> Do ho- I guess I've been told by the crowd last Saturday that I'm a master of voices and that I should probably just do impressions, like predominantly. Maybe hey, I have Rich to lean Little, into people who make a whole living doing impressions. Jeff yeah. Dunham, uh, well, kind of just pop this, but Rich Little did impressions, yeah. And um, who's the Italian guy who does the, all the impressions? Oh, 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 oh. We're going to blank for the next 10 minutes. The next 10 I'm minutes. I'm old. I haven't seen your moment. We'll blanking we'll about yeah. who the Italian dude who does all the great impressions is. I'll remember to three in the morning after the podcast yeah. is over. I'll yeah, wake up. That's, that's, that's what, yeah. and, I'm, and I refuse to consult the Oracle. If we're going to fuck up, we're just going to fuck up live and in effect. But exactly. In about 10 minutes, it's, it's going to come back to me. So, <laughs> so um, we were at Levi's. Roger we were Nader, talking right? about influences. Oh, yeah, yeah. Roger. And, yeah, so, yeah, so he slapped a sass out of Scotty G in my 20s, which, thank God, he did it in my first six months of comedy, or I you know, might not be working anywhere. <laughs> but, but Robert Rebecca brought me out, and I would run this comedy class uh, teaching, trying to teach the young comics before the open mic how to structure and act, what the do's and don'ts. And, and again, this is... This is just an example. This is not negative talk or, or right. not. I'm not gonna mention any names. It doesn't matter who the comic was. Yeah, like it was it, one unnamed of those, asshole. Yeah. Well, yeah. And actually, he's not an asshole. He's a really nice guy. Unnamed, so very I'm, nice guy. I'm doing some I'm doing some love here. He's a nice guy. It was just it was just the point about taking the advice that I've learned over my years of doing this to try to help young comedians. We in the summer in Erie, no one wants to be inside. Everyone wants to be on the lake, on the water, at Oliver's Beer Garden. You want to be outside in the in the nice weather. So we actually did an open mic in July years ago and had like eight people in the crowd. That was it for like nine comics. Eight people. We have more comics than audience. Each comic brought their plus one. No, it wasn't that. No, <laughs> one, was, I wish they did that because they had the plus one. We'd have uh, was, we would have, have 17 18, people. Shit. Yeah, they just came by themselves, right? So, um, I. At the class that week, I, a comic had done a new joke. It says, you know what? That is a joke that is too sensitive in today's environment. And, you know, you shouldn't, so you shouldn't do that joke. It could lose the crowd. Because I made that mistake of losing the crowd doing a joke like that May 1st, 2008. And I won't mention the club or city, but I lost the crowd for the headliner. And the, the, head, the owner of the club was not happy with me at all. So I, I'm trying to educate them from the mistakes I've made so yeah. same mistakes. That's I'm, why I call you the elder statesman of the Erie comedy. You're making me blush. I, I really I appreciate that. Thank you. Well who else has the, the but, background? What is your what is your C V, huh? Yeah, that's right. How many shows have you done? Where have you done them? What cities, the clubs? Who have you trained with? But I this comic run. did the joke. He did the joke yeah. of the show and he was like one of the first comics. It did offend the table. So the table of four after the comic did the joke, I won't say he or she, but after the comic did the joke, um, the table one table of four paid their bill and left. So now I got like seven comics and four people. And so, I'm, I mean, if it was a bigger room, might have lost more people. But, but my point was, I, I'm not, when I try to help young comics that want to do this, for a living or get famous or you don't know you don't know who the next Michael Jordan of comedy is going to be. Right? Right, you don't right. know. It, 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 there's a lot of factors that go into it. But if they really want my advice and feedback, I will give it to them. And if you don't want to listen, that's up to you. But when I do it, I'm not doing it to hear myself talk, to breathe my own air. I am doing it really out of care to help those comics that want to learn to be better. Well, that takes what? Uh, human beings used to identify as empathy you know like when you're empathetic towards others you see you know a young person or even somebody like me like I'm not too much younger than you are but I'm still kind of new to this thing so you have to have an openness and a willingness to say like well here's a mentor here's an individual who's done this so you know if you you listen to them uh, you can ignore them to your detriment uh, but you know bombing um, not doing well you know like flop sweat you know instant stinking mm. armpits like that's part of comedy that's part of doing is, comedy yeah. and you're not a comic until you've gone out there and died on the stage and, yeah. and tried to recuperate and maybe couldn't recuperate and just slithered off in 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 shame like you can't you know call yourself a comic until you've done those reps i've i haven't done nearly any of those reps i can't even really call myself a comic yet i and actually i my worst night ever every comic you know you can do the same set three nights in a row to three different crowds and kill, kill. twice and die once. You, you know, what I like to tell the young comics is, okay, when you're Robin Williams, Bill Cosby, Eddie Murphy, all these, you know, Sam Kennison, Elaine Boozler, when you're a famous comedian and you're in a club, people 
know who you are. They're going to go see you because they they're like ready to laugh. Yeah, the ninety percent. So maybe you know Jerry Seinfeld's all of them. Maybe ten percent of the people say, you know what, uh, you know I've been lived under a rock for ten years, never heard a Jerry Seinfeld joke or bit. I'm going to see what he's all about. But yeah. ninety plus percent of the people in the audience know that comedian, know their material, know their comedic character, and they're going to laugh. Okay, they're going to laugh at most of the jokes, okay? But when you're at our phase, even me, Scotty G, who is not a famous comedian at all, okay? When I do a show, I have done the same set two nights, two days in a row, and one day it kills, and the next day I hardly get any laughs because they don't know my character. They don't know, they're not coming to see me. They're yeah. coming to see a comedy show. So I tell the young comics, don't get discouraged. Now, as Steve Martin teaches in his master class, is if you do, when you do a new joke, do it three times. Never do it just once. Do it three times. Not in a row. Not in a row. No, no, yeah, three, <laughs> three shows, but not three. Yeah, not three times in a row. Yeah, excellent pickup there. Um, <laughs> he says if it if it kills all three times, you got a good joke. If it bombs all three times, never do it again. Right. Or rewrite it. Maybe you can rewrite it to make it right. work. Um, if it if it let's say it works two out of three, probably keep it. Maybe try it a fourth time. Works one out of three, maybe do it a fourth time, see if it goes. But, but you know, never just rely on one show. If a joke bombs one show, don't get rid of it automatically. That's a very small may, sample audience yeah. that you've just run that by. And yeah. just because that particular group who is maybe looking for something else or the comedian you're opening for has a different kind of approach, right. you know, than you. But, you know, warming up the crowd. I mean, that's their comedian through their entire career is like warming up a crowd on a game show. Right. And just right. running around and being zany to get people like feeling goofy. So as soon as the cameras are <laughs> exactly. on, like it's eh, <laughs> fabulous prizes can be yours on the price is right. Like, exactly. And then exactly everyone's right. like, ah. yeah. and there's a com- there's comedians that have made their living and you never heard of them. Right. Because their entire career was like a hype man. Right. You know? and, and, and that's why I say, don't get discouraged if you bomb one day. If no one laughs, if we do a show, say when we do the show of Voodoo tonight and if five comics bomb, I'm going to tell them, don't worry about it. Shake it off. Do the same set again in another show. Maybe it'll kill. Yeah, these are life lessons, you know. Yeah. And then sometimes it's all about the delivery of a joke. Like, you know, um, my buddy uh, Mike, you know, he, he did a, a bit that I thought would kill. And he's like, but the delivery wasn't, like, spot on. And, like, the sound was – we were working on the sound. But, like, I want him to, to do it again. Like, do it two more times. Like, twice more. And then you know, put, set the delivery on a certain syllable, boom, and then watch that joke right. blow up. So – yeah, and you just try stuff. Like, my whole thing is, like, I kind of come from the Norm McDonald school where, like, if it's funny to me or Pat Oswalt, if it's funny, yeah. I send it. Like, one of my big inspirations was Patton uh, said something about how he'd be at home and he would see, like, an email form for some company and he wanted to, like, create a complaint or a compliment or, or call something in. He's like, is it, it, and he's like, no, I probably shouldn't send this. Like, is it funny? No, I'm sending it. If it's funny, send it. That's Right. That's my thing. If, and it's funny to you, like an artist is making art, like a real artist is making art for themselves. They're right. going to look at that like, that shit looks cool. I made something that looks cool to me. Right. And then you're only pleasing yourself. Like too many people are painting. I wonder if somebody's going to like this. Like any music, art, uh, you know, it's like uh, uh, Rick Rubin said it. Um, any music, art, whatever you do is for yourself. As soon as you start making it with other people in mind, like... Right. It's now it's it's kind of lost its soul. And that's it. Yeah. And, and actually, I forgot to mention Steve Martin is a huge influence. I took his class. So there's so many comics. But one thing um, you're absolutely right is see, this is the old age senior moment. I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, do you want to hear about my worst night ever of comedy? Yeah, you were doing this that earlier. Good that was your young comic. So let's hear I, about. Uh, all right, everybody, just to remind you real quick, we're listening to the Golden Age podcast. Uh, my name is PJ Cody. I'm an amateur comic, and I'm here with Scotty G Live. Uh, Scotty G with an I. Look him yep. up on Facebook. So you want to real quick drop some of your uh, socials or whatever so that people can uh, can uh, learn more from Sage Wisdom. Power yeah. on. So it's uh, Scotty Space G Space Live on Facebook. Scotty G Live with an I, like Scotty Brothers Records. Yep, that was exactly. uh, uh, Weird Al Yankovic's first label. S-C-O-T-T-I. That's my... Uh, my comedy manager when I was I mean, actually I've only been Scotty G since 2019. I that's when I did my stage name uh, instead of my real name. And uh, yeah, my manager said let's spell it S C O T T I. I thought it would stand out. And unfortunately, I googled it. There's three other Scotty G's in the world. Porn stars. The same way. Porn stars. No, right? they're not. They're actually, they're musicians. Luckily. Musicians. Okay. Yeah, at least they're not porn stars. Yeah. Maybe they do porn on the side. <laughs> they might. Yeah. 
And then my my website is scottyg.com. So S C O T T I G dot com. Scottyg dot com. And that's where you guys are going to learn. Uh, if if you want to learn about the craft, I'm certain there's some resources on that. I don't want to speak for your website, but I'm certain at least actually I haven't had a resource. I told him how to contact me, so I could just talk to him directly. Yeah. There you go. So that's the hotline to to the, the, the master yeah. himself. Rather than you know look at on demand, you can demand on Scotty to talk to you. Yeah. So I've only gotten spam so far, like gibberish message. Well, I'm really kind of sad because my pictures are up there, and I haven't gotten the fake female robot. Bots reaching out to me on the website yet, so I'm obviously not attractive. I have a face for radio, like they say. What yeah. you, you mean you haven't heard? I have a best friend I talk to all the time that calls me all the time. His name is Scam. Scam, yeah, I guess you know Scam yeah. Likely, right? I get Scam. You know Scam Likely? Yeah, I do. I is, do he, yeah. is he a homie? Are you guys, are you tight? Oh yeah, we're, we're tight. Yeah, we're tight. Yeah. Because like I don't get a lot of inbounds. I'm not gonna lie to you. And and me and Scam Likely, like we get along pretty good. Yeah, they're always. Oh, yeah. He's always being positive, want to sell me something, you know? Oh, yeah. He's got, some, a, yeah. he's got a great, like, Kuala Lumpur accent going on. I just had a guy faking to be CEO of a major company, told me I had a dead relative from France that died in 1911, and he wanted to split 4.9 euros with me. And I'm like, you think I was born yesterday, really? <laughs> Those Nigerians are getting very, very elaborate in their in yeah. their like the whole deposed king thing that's become a meme. So yeah. now they got they got to branch out a little bit. Exactly right. Yeah. All right. So uh, this is the Golden Age podcast uh, with PJ uh, Scotty G. Live is live in effect. And um, uh, before uh, our, our shitty uh, commercial segue, I was ready to uh, <laughs> he was ready to uh, el- elucidate us on uh, his worst, uh, ever. worst gig, which I have yet to experience since I'm so new. But uh, let's so hear it. Four months into doing comedy, especially after my Valentine's Day killer opening set, uh, I'm at the Funny Bone in Cincinnati, and that's when uh, MTV, it was HBO. It was HBO was doing, uh, starting the Comedy Channel. And they were like open auditioning for new faces for comedy jocks. Yeah. So I'm only four months in. So I, I knew I was a long shot, but hey, why not send them my seven minute set? Get in there. So we had someone filming, professionally filming. The show with the Funny Bone, the open mic night, the Funny Bone in Cincinnati to send, you know, our tape to HBO to be a comedy jock as an audition tape. And I went up there that night. Huge comedy mistake. I was too young and stupid. I did seven minutes of totally new material and didn't get a single laugh. I even did a Stevie Wonder blind joke, which I regret to this day. Because of my, um, I was married at the time. My mother-in-law's bathroom. She had the like all the Star and Globe magazines, and there was an article that that they were going to give Stevie White his sight back by doing a transplant with lizard eyes. Stevie Wonder, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, Stevie Wonder. They were going to yeah. get his Stevie Wonder sight back. He by was going to get lizard eyes. Lizard eyes. Okay. So I did a routine about imitating Stevie Wonder after the transplant. Like now he's a lizard. Like I would do the tongue, you know, sticking out in the sounds, and it totally bombed. Uh, so I regret even writing that bit. Anyway, my wife at the time, we were driving home, as we did from the club, we'd stop and get White Castle because I was a huge White Castle fan at the time before my digestive system couldn't handle it anymore. <laughs> they call them sliders for a reason, not to be gross. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, I like that. The oh, no, they joke. actually had a commercial in Cincinnati uh, for White Castle at that time around Valentine's Day said, hey, and for those romantic dinners for two, and they showed a little table covered with White Castle burgers and a couple of glasses of wine and a candle, the candle. Said, hey, the White Castle family pack for those romantic dinners for two. Oh, baby, like, you had me at small square hamburger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you I really know how to wet a pair of panties hat, <laughs> sweetheart. <laughs> I actually wrote a bit about that as saying, yeah, for dessert you serve K.O. Pectate. So... <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, we got White Castle hey, on the way home, and my wife is like, no, you weren't that bad. She's trying to be the supportive wife. No, you you didn't bomb. You got some laughs. I heard some laughs. That one guy cracked a smile. Yeah. Well, I went home and popped in the VHS tape, because back then it was still VHS. Sure. 1989, to watch my seven-minute bet, because maybe my wife was right, and I was being too hard on myself, because if you talk to anyone that knows me, I'm the, the person that's – you can't be any harder on me than I am – on myself. I grew up in Jersey. I got bullied. Yeah. And my family says things to me. That's why you can't offend me. You can't call me something my family hasn't already called me. Okay? That's like my, one of my favorites, Troy yeah. Bond. Uh, he said, uh, he's like, the lady was heckling him. And he's like, look, lady, ain't nothing you can say about me that I ain't said six inches in front of the mirror. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. So I popped the tape in and I'm not hearing any laughter. And in the middle of my seven minute act, the cameraman 
filming me for HBO says, and the microphone picked it up, says, oh, my God, this guy is dying up there. <laughs> <laughs> and I still have the tip. I can play it for you, PJ. You come over someday. I put it on. I, I put it on DVD. I still have that show. That should be your like intro to your act, comedy act yeah. every night. Like play yeah. that sound. Oh my god! Because yeah. like you can only go up from there. Right? It can only, yeah, it only got. It did only get better from there. Oh, exactly, that's right? beautiful, man. That's some <laughs> sweet validation of a bomb. Yeah, but it was. I tell you, it keeps you. You got to be humble in comedy, and you. You. It, it's like like with a pitcher. I played all four sports. When a pitcher. You know, I was pitching and threw a home run in baseball. You got to forget about it, and you got to just get a strike on the next pitch, get the next guy out. If it was a hockey goal, you give up a goal, you got to focus and not give up another one. Same with comedy. If you bomb, forget it and move on. You know, the best athletes are the ones who can shake off. Like a good goalie, he can shake off a, a, a bad goal and uh, not allow it to break the veneer. And you know, that's it's perseverance. It's like. You know, what do you what kind of chances do you want to take in this life? What are you willing to do to put your ass out? You know, the, you know, they say the number one fear in this world is public speaking. It's not right. spiders or heights or, you know, whatever. It's it's public speaking. Yep. So yep. like um, last week, uh, my my neighbor, uh, the, the beautiful Anna Snowden, she said um, and she was on stage. Like she had a really good never, first show. Yeah, she yeah. had never been on stage. She's like, you're doing a comedy mic. I'm going to come. I'm going to show up. I'm going to. You know, write some bits, and I, I, I call. I said, "How you doing?" She's like, "I'm, I'm at home. I'm working on my set." I'm like, "I'm not working on shit, but you know, I appreciate your gumption." Yeah. And she got in there, and she got up on stage, and showed a lot of confidence, and she was funny, and the crowd responded like, "You couldn't have asked for more for a first appearance." That was a great first appearance. I was really impressed by her. Is she gonna do it tonight? Do you know? I don't know. I hope so. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll message her about it. But we'll go knock on her door when I drop you off. We'll say, yeah, yeah. you gotta be there tonight. Yeah. So that's that's what's going on. Pretty much, uh, comedy as you are is gonna be um, every Saturday, uh, with a few exceptions, uh, maybe two exceptions. Uh, it's gonna be pretty much every Saturday between now and straight through September. Yep. So uh, feel free to come out to the Voodoo. Brewery. Uh, I tell people, uh, meet me under the clock. That's the that's the eerie catchphrase. Uh, yep. It is the Boston store, which is the epicenter. I was saying last week, and I'll say it again this week. If you're an eerieite, you go to Voodoo first. That's your meetup. Meet me under the clock. Right. And then then you meet there. Go from there. You get a beer, and then saunter away. Go bar crawl. But you started at Voodoo. If you're, that's seven p.m. for our show. If you you don't <laughs> give up the ship, you're a true eerieite. This is what you're gonna do. I will cajole. I will browbeat and do whatever I have to do to let you know that the voodoo is probably the best environment near uh, Shout out to Kyle Hauser for taking a chance on uh, a noob, noob, noob like myself to get this going. Uh, last week, we, we did the thing. Um, Kyle's a great guy. Do you, um, let's talk a little bit about the, the, the show last week, uh, the ups and downs. Like, what, how did you feel, like, as an experienced veteran? Like, well, for a first open mic, like, it, it wasn't. Yeah, no, it's, uh, just to, to say, because uh, PJ and I only worked here the first time last week. So I've basically got to know him for a week. We've become fast friends. So Scotty G is going to try to make his, you know, I, I am doing some traveling and I, I'm trying to get some shows out of town. Uh, but if I'm in town and free, I'm going to do the, all the shows I can for yeah, PJ and Voodoo. So you'll see both of us there, number one, for a, you know, for a first time Obviously, you always had the logistics, a, a new venue, first time show. We had a few sound problems, but when I talked to the people, most of the crowd could hear us, and we're working on the, to fixing the sound problems. Yeah, for and tonight. then Kyle hustled over with an amp and a yeah. speaker and a microphone yeah, or an amp show. and a mic, and yeah. and and everyone's like, okay, fixed. They fixed but, right. Uh, shout out to Kyle for scrambling like that. Oh yeah, he was huge. He, he was a general manager taking uh, over the sound for us. Yeah, and huge. coming over for every act and yeah. listening and laughing and providing ambiance and just being like the dude. So yeah, he was a great guy. I love Kyle. Dude. Can't say enough about those guys. Go give them your money. P best beer in town. You have to have the lacto cooler. Yep. To me, that's my that's running through my veins. The lacto. It's like <laughs> it's like a green Ghostbuster. Juice. I thought it was that Tim Wharton's turbocharged uh, coffee there you got no, this morning. I'm gonna really try hard to not drink and cast gotcha okay. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. gonna really like coffee is enough to, to set, set me up um, when I when I go up, up you know I'll slam a monster energy right before I hit the stage yep. just so I, I can overcompensate uh, but but yeah that's a you well know. you don't want me on Red Bull or anything I'm, I am from Jersey and New York City and tend to talk really fast if I'm amped up you'll won't hear any of my jokes so you gotta slow down so you were born and raised down the shore yeah I, I grew up on the Jersey Shore yep yeah and let's then, hear uh, about let's hear about the uh, 
the 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 birth and upbringing of uh, one Scott. Scotty G. Oh yeah, but just get back to the show real quick. Oh the yeah, show, yeah, yeah. The first show it was hey, it was a great open mic night. We had someone from Cleveland there. We had some seasoned people. We had some new people. We had a Buffalo guy come yeah, in. Buffalo guy, yeah. Yep. So we it was it was a nice first run and some and locals. Be, yeah, and and uh, the key is to keep it growing. And what was nice is there were some people that weren't there for the comedy show, but they stayed. I mean, yeah. they came there to eat dinner and have beers, but they stayed. They stuck around. Stuck around and listened, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that's the beauty of it. You know, comedy as you are is a concept of no humans uh, uh, rejected. Um, come as you are. You know, that's kind of a play on words. Right. Comedy as you are. Uh, you can get your few minutes, three to four, five, six, whatever you think you deserve. You get up there, tell a story, do a funny voice. You know, the point is, you as a human being, you're going up and, and you're practicing and you're and you're you're interacting and and that's an energy exchange and that's all you want whether right. they laugh or not another thing johnny carson said that really stuck with me is like maybe you don't always have to make them laugh maybe sometimes you just got to make them smile right that's true Do you know yeah. what i mean like i just want like people sit, sit, sit good. with that for a second right. Right. like a lot of comedians like one of my favorites is pablo francisco Okay, yeah, and yeah. and Pablo Francisco, he's like a coked up like like a Latino Robin Williams. Yep, <laughs> uh, that's and that, that that's not a detractor. No, no, for, no, because I don't want to make him sound one dimensional. But I'll go and wait in line at a comedy club by myself to see Pablo. To see him, gotcha. I've he's met him. Yeah. You know, we've communicated. You know, at some point I'm going to get him on the show. Like he's a person Perfect. that I know I can get. Nice. And Pablo, when you sit down, you do not catch your breath. For however long he ha wants to be on stage, you yeah. will not catch your breath. He'll come out with music and it's like, and and like, well, yep. you're not telling jokes, but I'm already laughing. Right. And then he can do jokes that he's done a hundred times, and he'll do them, spin them in a different way. Like he does a joke about doing ecstasy and then getting pulled over by a cop, yep. and then he saw the lights and he starts <laughs> dancing to the cop lights. <laughs> And, and then the, one of my favorite things he said is like an ecstasy, like, uh, are, you, are you on ecstasy? They're like, are you eating? Are you eating? He's right. like, are you, uh, are you eating? Are you eating? He's like, no, I'm Pablo. <laughs> That's you like, <laughs> you must be that Speedy Gonzalez cartoon character from years ago where he, with the energy, you know? He's, he's, yeah. he's the human equivalent of a Speedy, Speedy Gonzalez. Gonzalez. Andale, yeah. andale, arriba, 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 andale, andale. andale. <laughs> uh, I miss, I miss, like, I was raised on Looney Tunes, man. Like, so I, was I. People are like, how'd you learn about classical music? I'm like, Looney Tunes. Well, that, that's what kills me. Like, I, when, I, when I was working, because I, I retired from my day job to do comedy. Uh, Congratulations. Months, a few months ago. Yeah, I, I couldn't do the day job anymore. I hated my job for 12 years. Who cares? So, uh, nice to have that option. <laughs> I, I mean, well... I'm poor now, but you know. But hey, I'd rather be poor. I can at least pay my bills. Put it that way. I rich can't do in spirit and, and enthusiasm. Rich in spirit, right? It's, it's it's not all about money. It's about being happy. The um, but it's funny when I'm working with all these twenty somethings that don't get my jokes. Like so, you mentioned the Andale Arriba, the Speedy Gonzalez. At work, we had a system called Arriba. So we're in a meeting. And go Andale Arriba. Arriba. And everyone looked at me like I was like an alien. They're like, "What do you?" They had no idea the Andale Arriba meant. That's how young these people were. Good God. Then. Do you remember laughing? Like the British. Um, it was oh, like in Rowan 70s. and Martin's laughing. Yeah, the Rowan and Martin laughing. Yeah. yeah. And then Artie Johnson would play the German soldier and part the leaves and go, very interesting. Very interesting. I'm, I'm say that too. new to my last company. This goes back even 20 years ago with these young people. And there was a guy my age, an older guy, talking to these young new people and training them. And he had a bunch of plants on his desk. So I walked to the other side of the desk and I parted the plants and I did the Artie Johnson like very into this thing. And he laughed and these 20 somethings were like, what is wrong with you, dude? They were like, they're like, oh, I get it. Homer Simpson when he fades into the bush. Yeah, that's what it, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, they had no idea. Artie that's Johnson what it was. isn't. Yeah. yeah and I, I grew up. Those are influences for me. Like uh, uh, Rowan and Martin's laughing for yep. in Hee Haw. Uh, yeah, yeah. Benny Hill. Carol Burnett show. I was I was, was still a ton, uh, Tim we're, Conway, we're in Harvey the same Corbin. yeah we're in the yeah. same uh, somewhat of a same time frame but uh, yeah. um, do you remember watching Benny Hill? Oh, all the time. Did you My get brother, your first boner from watching Benny Hill? I I don't think I was too young. I don't know if I did. I, I, I remember getting I remember I getting it, yeah. boners very very young. Yeah. Like I, I oh was, yeah because all the cha women yeah all I the, remember yeah, getting right. a boner at a very young like I don't know how old you're supposed to be to get a boner but I remember you I was did, like yeah. five six years old getting boners. <laughs> Like, am I, am I, is there something wrong with me my that, that I could get a boner at six? Listen, my little brother got me hooked on Benny Hill. He was watching before. Yeah, me. and they'd yeah. slap bald guy's yeah. head yep. and he'd run around. 
That's why I never wanted to go bald because I'm like, I don't want somebody slapping how, my bald head. How about the Dean Martin comedy roast? They have them all on DVD. And they, they were so drunk. They, Everybody yeah, was pissed drunk. drunk. Except for Foster Brooks. <sighs> I yeah. miss drunk comedy. Yeah, it's, I do too. But I they miss drunk did comedy. jokes. I couldn't do any of those jokes anymore. Most of them, you can't do them. You know, uh, it's it like you sensitive. said about Steve Martin. Like yeah. uh, the thing about Steve Martin is, I always told people like I just didn't understand like his. You know, like The Jerk is the funniest movie ever made. Oh, it's classic. No I doubt in my jerk. mind, yeah. The Jerk is the funniest movie classic. ever made, right? Yeah. But I, at this whole time, I was just like, I really want to understand like what Steve Martin was doing, and I think I figured it out because yeah. I couldn't really respect it until I really fully understood it. And it's Steve Martin is imitating comedians. He he's doing an he's doing he's he's, he's interesting. He's, he's he's what's the word? It's a characterization. Not an impression, right? But it's like he's doing a bit about comics. He's doing a comedian. It, 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 I don't know if this makes sense. That's an interesting take. I've never thought of it that he's way. He's a comedian doing an impression of of, of comics. Comedians, yeah. And 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 I, I I was very hard for me to wrap my head around that style of humor. But now I I think I'm starting to get it with Steve Martin. Well, you know another thing he taught me. Now Steve Martin in his master class will tell you don't work the crowd unless you're. A season professional because it'll backfire. And he's right. Yep. Before I took the master class, I went up for one show at room 33 after I came, like my second show after I came out of retirement. And I said, I'm not going to have any jokes planned. I'm going to just talk to the crowd as the, to warm up the crowd. Yeah, physical and challenge. And pick a joke off of what their answers were. Right. Like do one of my bits uh, that will lead me to m what bits to do, right? And they didn't. They had all these jobs that were so boring. It was like I um, – I, I HR I sit there and I HR I'm an accountant or I dog sit I'm like it was nothing that led to any of my material I'm a parking attendant yeah and then then I finally got one that was good yeah she was a prison guard in a female prison there you go that's comedy gold but I froze and I'm like oh does anyone have a good job and she even looked at me like are you kidding me and she was right I totally missed I so Steve Myers right unless you're seasoned don't work the crowd but what he taught yeah. me is when you're on stage don't waste any time. Don't waste any opportunity for a laugh, even when you take a drink of water, make it part of your act. So if it was when Steve Martin took a drink of water, he'd spit it on the stage. Yeah. Because to for a laugh, he would like, oh, I'm leaking whatever. And it, it, people would laugh. So I even when I take my water breaks, it's part of my act. Now, of course, I don't want to spit on the stage because in today's day and age, people think that's gross with all the germs or I'd upset the, the state, the owner right. of the club or whatever. But like when I take my drink of water, I'm like, oh. My vodka, do this impersonation of water. Yeah. I'll try to make a wisecrack out so of it. Do you guys drink you know? straight vodka too? Yeah. Is it like Svedka so. brand? Uh, sometimes if I take a drink of water, I'll be like, hold on, I'm going to uh, hit my invisible bong. Hold yeah, on. Exactly. Yeah, here we go. Hold on. Watch this. <laughs> I love that. I heard that. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it works. You know, like Wonder Woman has. Invisible jet. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> My invisible ball. Right, PJ is choking right now. He's choking right here. No, I'm not choking. I'm smoking marijuana. I'm do the Heimlich. in the studio in uh -oh. the podcast studio. I am smoking cannabis indica, Northern Lights haze, crossed with a Jack Herrer. So you're smoking pot in the joint here. <laughs> I, I came up with a good joke the other day. Like uh, somebody it. told me. Um, uh, that I'm good with impressions. So I'm like, well, what other impressions can I come up with? Right. And the other day, I was like, oh, I got one. I got one. This is a, a CV joint on a 1989 Ford Explorer. Okay. It's kind of like. Is there people, people know what a CV joint is besides you and me? Some well, when they, hear, when they hear it, yeah, if it's a know. good impression. <laughs> like if it's a Ford Econoline van from 86. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like, you know, the other joke I came up with is like, I don't know anything about mechanics. I'm no good with cars. I think I thought a CV joint was that when you took your resume to uh, roll up a doobie. <laughs> CV joint? Anybody? Yeah. Curriculum Vita? No. Uh, See, that's a, that's an over your header, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's it a little be. over the head, right? Well, Bob, Bob Zaney does that. Like, the problem is I can't do it because Bob Zaney did it. By the but way, I, best I, comic I, name of all time, Bob Zaney. Bob, he's oh, nothing he's better. There'll never be a better comedian. He's another name. influence, yeah. Because he and he is that his Christian made, name. He's made dad jokes funny. The, Was that his Christian name? I don't think I don't think it is. I don't think so. Well, in either case, it's the best I, I actually, comedy name of all time. I've actually worked him uh, like an MC at the uh, funny uh, no, juniors here in Erie years ago. So I met him and I've talked to him. But he did. He does a bit where um, like he's having trouble getting a job. And he's filling out the applications. Maybe that's the problem. He's like, date, small edible fruit. 
sex as often as possible. <laughs> you know, so he's like, he's like, is English your first language? No hablo. You know, something like that. Or, or C, like C, something yeah, like that. that yeah, that happened to me once. I, I, uh, I sent out an X, a, a Zost, you know, instead of yeah. a post. I call him Zost with an X. Yeah. So my Zost was uh, uh, something about, uh, uh, that I use more than three but less than five exclamation points in my last job application. Is this cool or not? Nah? Is that self-destructive, maybe? <laughs> Word of advice, if you want a job, don't use any exclamation points. Right. I would say zero exclamation points, zero exclamation points is yeah. best utilized when sending a job application resume thing in. It's yeah. probably important. You said dad jokes. You ready for one of those? Oh, wanna, I have, I have a ton of dad jokes. Do you want to have yeah. a dad off? I have one good dad joke. Go for it. You go first. You're okay, first, so Scotty. You're the guest. Do you know? Do you know why you can't hear a pterodactyl go to the bathroom? Why can't you hear a pterodactyl go to the bathroom? The P is silent. <laughs> Jazz clap. Jazz clap. That's He's another. He's picking it up on a the new, mic. A new tradition is born. Jazz clap in the studio. So that was, a wonderful, jazz hands that was a wonderful dad yeah. joke. Um, yeah, not enough room in this room to do the jazz hands. Right, so what are you going to, what's your dad um, joke? So I came up with one, and I know it's a groaner. Like, gr dad jokes are supposed to be oh, groaners, supposed to be, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I actually have technically two, but one is more of an observation. But So um, I had read somewhere that when uh, coral gets stressed out, that right. it dies. <laughs> that if you stress out a coral, right, coral they will dies. just die. Right. Right. And I'm just like, well, what could possibly stress out a coral? Right. Easy. Current events. Oh my God. <laughs> so that's a groaner. That's a dad joke, that you know. Is. But there's a value of dad jokes. The girls like the dad bods now. Oh, they do. They the like girls, you yeah. when you wear the, the New Balance, like yeah. the dad shoes, and maybe you have those bike shorts that the old PE coaches used to wear, and you maybe you're tucked in. But it's not working for me. My old massage therapist when I got divorced. I said, you know, hey, how's the dating scene out there? She's like, oh, you have a dad bod, you'll be fine. But no woman, but I, I, but I work out, so I'm trying to lose it. I didn't want someone to like me because I had a dad bod, a gut. So I work out and I lift and I try to get all this muscle and stuff. And no woman sit on me since my divorce. So I said, my dad well, bod wasn't working for me. It may be working for other guys. But not shout me. out to the broken nuclear family. Thank you. To, thanks to divorce thanks culture to, divorce. Yeah, to exactly. give all these girls daddy issues so that we can exactly become right. relevant again. I know. Yeah. Like, okay. Like <laughs> I, I, was, I was with this girl uh, a couple years ago, maybe five years ago, and I'm 48. Maybe, well, maybe closer to 10 years ago, but I was in my 40s and she was 23. Okay. And people were like, How'd you do that? Are you getting like, that the look or there? I was like, like high fives. I was just looking like, at people like, hey, it's nice work if you can get it. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, that was my. But uh, it, so she, why didn't it last? Was it because she hated me? Oh, she, okay. she hated me the entire seven months we were together. Did, why did she go seven months if she hated you? I'm confused. This is, Daddy issues. This, this is the hipster, you know, twenty something culture mm -hmm. that we live in. Like they don't even know what they like or don't like. They're just. They're just going along. I'm going along with it. I'm like, I'm going to ride this wave as long as I can pump it and right. I can stay on this wave. I'm going to continue trying to surf. Right. And, you know, I would ride a bike like seven miles to her house to hang out or whatever. And, like, we did our thing. Um, and uh, we have fans. We have fans. We have fans. Hold on. Let's show them the dog. Let's show them the dog. Let's show them the dog. Hit, show them the dog. Show them the dog. Show them the dog. Show them the dog. <laughs> Bella <laughs> woo, 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 woo. Bella, Bella speaks. That's our manager, Bella. Bella, Bella the producer. She just she she's just, a producer. Yeah. She just gate capped like some people. Hey, yeah. Sit down, okay. Uh, Bella Ace wants to say hello, and apparently she just did. Okay, so you know what? Have a seat, Ding Dong. She's going to check her P-mail right now. She's wearing a T-shirt that says "Bite Me." So. Exactly. I love that shirt. Yeah. And now she's purring. Thank you, Bella. Thank you for your participation in the podcast. Those no, because when I got divorced, my buddy told me that I said I don't want to be the creepy old guy because actually, what's funny is in Erie here hanging out, we're hanging at 33 is a lot younger crowd than me. Yeah, and a lot of these um, early 20s girls love hanging out with me, but I'm like the fun uncle. It's like they don't want to date. You're me, the Funkle. We'll go, I'm calling you Funkle. Yeah, Funkle. They'll, we'll go to McCoy's and dance. We'll do this stuff, and they absolutely love me, but they have no interest in dating me. But let's say. There was an interest. My problem is, like, they don't get a lot of my older references, like Laughing and all these, you know, older comedians. I've never heard of them. They don't like the music. I'm an 80s rock guy. They like all this new funky stuff, which I'm not into as much. Yeah, music stopped so, being good around 1998, by the way. Yeah. So, so to me, all age, music. Right. So to me, age is just a number. It's not the age. It's the interest. It's like we're not interested in the same thing. It's got to be fun. Like, yeah. that's what my buddy told me. It's like, you know, I'm over here at the bar, and there's all these, like, 20-something girls, like, Am I relevant over here? I like a big beard. I look like, you know, uh, uh, Joe Roots. 
I, I, I look like, is that what they say about you? you look like Jervis. Well, well, that's what that's what Mike said. Um, Mike said okay. Yeah, Mike said uh, um, uh, I look like uh, Joe Roots, and he started telling me the story of Joe Roots. Right. So I think I have to develop a character. Like I think right. the next open mic I'm gonna go up and be like, just tell everybody I'm Joe Roots, <laughs> yeah. and I'll just like <laughs> you should you lament say, yeah. about the fact that the, the you know the government uh, uh, had me lobotomized so <laughs> they could take my land. I, I think it's a great Whee! character. To, Whee! Yeah. Whee! I think that's a good character to, to develop. So what are your other catchphrases? Do you have other catch phrases so my, my three catchphrases are i'm not feeling the love hence the divorce and i'm canceled because my my son who's a great son i love my son we're like best friends um he is gay just a fact that's not a bad thing hey that's called alternative lifestyles man yeah sorry, but i like saying i'm the i'm the i'm the proud father of a gay son that's why it's, I say it's the gay. lgbtqia plus plus plus, oh, plus yeah, left know, right I, left right left right ba ba start is it because i he told me right? it's lbgtq plus i didn't know the ia is that new yeah yeah yeah, that, yeah it's it's it's, it's ever changing well i'm gonna see him tomorrow it's so a I'll randomizer find i don't know what the i is and i think the a stands for ally so that means like you're just you're, you're just mildly interested in their cause. Okay, see, because 40 years in the corporal, IA was internal oh, auditing. Oh, I would you be, didn't want no, that. Well, no, not internal. <laughs> this would be intersex. Yeah, that's what intersex, the I, okay. intersex means, like, maybe you were, like, they used to call it hermaphrodite. Maybe you were born with, like, oh, both parts a four-inch clit yeah. or something like that. Something like that, yeah. yeah so, yeah. like, you're not, you know, and those, that's a, that's a certain percent. That's a, a very small percentage, but those are people, too, right? Is that what hermaph? I thought hermaphrodite was, like, a Marvel character, so that's what it really is. Right? <laughs> Sorry, bad joke. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, the dun, mighty dun. hermaphrodite. It's Thor, Captain America, and hermaphrodite. Yeah. So anyway, no, so um, those are my three catchphrases. The young canceled is when I do. It's funny I do all these jokes Hence about the my gay son taking me to gay bars, and they're not. Ninety-eight percent of my act is all true stories. My, that's that's my character. I tell true stories. It might you should be, have more lying. Yeah, sure. Ninety-eight yeah, percent. Well, they may Come be on. embellished a little bit, but they're all based on everything. Mac is based on a true story. So all these jokes about my son, I'm not picking on gay people. They're all true stories that have happened yeah. to us in bars, and and I think they're funny. And this they are this gay laugh. son character he's created as an excuse yes, so that yes, he yeah. can be a, a homophobe. <laughs> I get it, Scott. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, good, exactly. co- good yeah. cover story, bro. We're gonna need to see the son for proof. What, well, what's even you know, what's even funnier is when he comes to my shows. Like he'll probably be at my. Um, my next night with Scotty G at 33, I have my own karaoke. Because I, what I do a night with Scotty G, it's I also sing is I'll usually during dinner sing a few songs while people eat so then they can focus on the comedy. Then I'll do my set. Wow. And I have a karaoke amp machine, so I don't need a band. I'd rather have a live band, but I just can't afford that now on what they're paying me. Anyway, so I use this karaoke machine I sing, but he has two mics. So I'll give my son a mic in the crowd so he can heckle me. And that's, that's my huge. comedy goal when my you know son who happens to be gay is there and he's like validating the story like no that's true or whatever or heckling me like you're canceled. You have the your own you have dies. your own fact checker. Yeah, right. You there have there your own crowd. biological offspring fact checker. That's beautiful. Yeah. I wish I wish more uh, comics would have like fact checkers to like validate them, you know? Right. Like like I guess that's the that's the concept of a hype man. I wanna I wanna pitch this to you. So Yeah, go for it. <clears throat> Like one of my favorite bits that I like to do is just I want a hype man. Like, where's my hype man? Right. Like, can I just have a person? You know, like uh, I don't know if you're into rap, but like you know, Chuck D had Flavor Flav and Public yeah. Enemy and 50 Chuck, cent. yeah, 50 cent. and then you know, like Cypress Hill, like would have Be Real, and then the yeah. guy named Send Dog who would just kind of back him up. Like, where's my hype man? Like he follows me around to right. the bank and to like you know public institutions and my relationships, and he just basically emphatically backs me up on all my statements. You know, right? You know, I'll just be like in the in the boardroom doing a presentation. Well, as you can see, this uh, uh, quarter. Uh, profits have exponentially increased by uh, approximately 13%. 13% motherfucker! <laughs> yeah! I'm like, there's my hype man. He kind of like Garrett Morris on Saturday Night Live. Yeah, he's throwing an exclamation point. Yeah. You know, but as a hype man, like, how far do you take that? Like, let's say, for instance, Cypress Hill, right? You had Be Real. You remember Be Real? He'd go, and sign in the membrane. And then and, uh, Send Dog would be like, and sign in the brain. Insane in the membrane. It's insane. Got no brain. <laughs> insane in the membrane. So it's like that contrast to those two right. things, right? So, but let's say you got your hype man. He's following you around. But how far do you take it, right? Let's right. say, let's just imagine this. Okay, it's Be Real, front man for Cypress Hill, West Coast, cannabis, hip hop. Shout out to DJ Muggs, Soul Assassins. Right. And let's say, um, you no, know, Be Real, he's walking. 
he's, he was with his lady friend. They're getting real serious. They're, they're about ready. He wants to lock it down. He figures, you know, we're on the beach. The sun's right about to set. This is like a perfect, idyllic situation. Right. To, like, I think this is the time. And so, like, he, all of a sudden, B-Rail gets real serious, you know, and he's probably just smoked a blunt, so his eyes are glazed. And then he gets down, you know, and what stops, you know, gets down on one knee. And I can imagine when, when B-Rail is serious, he kind of just looks like a big, sad basset hound. Right. So he looks up at the girl and then the sun's just about to dip. And here's Send Dog, you know, the, the hype man. But he's about five feet back. He's just, you know, playing the rear like a good hype man. Right, right. And then all of a sudden, Be Real gets down on one knee and he pulls out a, 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 a velvet box and, and he, he pops open the box. And, and the, the last glimmers of the sun just shine, just bling right off the, the big diamond. Right. right. And, and he looks up at, at his lady friend. Uh, and I don't know if he's married or not, I don't fact check my jokes. Mm. And he, he, he pulls out this ring and he holds it up to her and he goes, after a long pause, he goes, I love you very much, will you marry me? <laughs> and then, uh, and then you know, like, send dog, he's just like a dog, it's right. just been called, he's in the back, he's like, <laughs> and he's like, he can't resist her, right? He's just like, will you marry him? <laughs> yeah, motherfucker! Nuptials! <laughs> Do you remember Gary Morris on Saturday Night Send Dog ruined it. Bad dog. Bad dog. Bad send dog. <laughs> so that's when the hype man shit goes That reminds me. Remember Gary Morris on Saturday Night Live, the Huge news for the hard of hearing? News for the hard. Yeah. Uh, where like, happened Chevy to Chevy Chase would be like, I, 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 what's Kennedy doing? It's like, it's like, it's like our top story tonight. He's in the little bubble on the top. Our top story. That's like the hype man right there. That yeah. kind of humor is just really funny. Like, it is. And it's dead now. You know? and, and, you know, I think one of my very first memories of comedy is watching Eddie Murphy on Saturday Night Live because oh, yeah. when you're a little kid for my generation you probably did Buckwheat. you watched well you watched um, Mr. Rogers Neighborhood as Mr. A Rogers Neighborhood oh, we're, yeah. we're, we're in the same wheelhouse there yeah, right? yeah we are yeah, yeah so we'd watch Mr. Rogers and he did Mr. Robinson's Neighborhood yep I remember so that. he would be like what it's like in the hood and this is yeah. my I have to back up from the mic but this is my favorite part <laughs> here's how we answer the door in Mr. Robinson's Neighborhood boys and girls yeah <laughs> Who is it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and that it, Eddie Murphy will always be, you know, uh, an early influence and a genius. And yep. I guess it was always, you know, Mad Magazine, Cracked Magazine. All that stuff. Uh, I didn't understand National Lampoon at the time. It was a little over my head. But those influences were huge for me. And I was always making little skits. I mean, recording crap. I mean, right. 30 years ago, I was doing this. Oh, so. I do cassette tapes with the mic. I would do stuff. Yeah. I mean, I don't remember a single birthday party growing up, but I can remember bits on. I remember the Bill Murray, Lorraine Newman bit when he got VD. Um, and they danced over the school auditorium in a basketball game. I remember Richard Pryor. I think it was Bill Murray. It was a Bill Murray and Richard Pryor doing, and Lorraine Newman doing a, a spoof of The Exorcist. Yeah. And she like picked up a bowl of pea soup and threw it on Richard Pryor. And you're like, your mother sells so socks in hell. Like they would change the dirty <laughs> stuff to like, yeah, your mother is so socks in hell, you know? <laughs> so. That reminds me of like, you know, the TV edits where, where they, um, they, 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 just pretty much butcher something like yeah. it's a curse word but you can't really like find your way out of it like the best example is my favorite movie is the big lebowski yes yeah, it's, it's pretty much my my religion like you know i'm, I'm like <laughs> i'm actually ordained as a dudist minister oh in, nice, in the nice. Dudist i get a good ordained i want to marry people when they're drunk yeah bars just randomly <laughs> nice. yeah, you ready goal. for this yeah i'm ready yeah <laughs> yeah so and in, in the in the the dude um there's a line where um that they they think that somebody stole their car but it really wasn't the the kid who stole the car. Right, right. So uh, the kid is stonewalling him because he doesn't know what he's talking about. And, and Walter <laughs> goes, All right, you might want to look out that window. They said, this is what happens when you fuck a stranger in the ass. Yeah. And he goes outside <laughs> with a with a, with a, uh, a tire iron. He starts smashing this brand new uh, Corvette. Do you see what happens, Larry? <laughs> this is what happens, Larry. This is what happens when you fuck a stranger in the ass. Do you see what happens, Larry? Like, and you're in the editing booth, like trying to make a TV version of this yeah, movie. Yeah, you, you can't. Yeah. What are you gonna do? You know what they came up with? What? Big Lebowski fans know this. This is the ultimate trivia question. I, what, what did you do? This is what happens when you find a stranger in the Alps. Oh my God. You know what they do? Leave the weapon to clean that up. Oh, I'm sure there's a when lot. When said Mel Gibson would say "motherfucker," he goes "mother funster." Those fun fun and he was those funsters. I'm like, you're kidding me. Is that's that your first? That's gonna be your first uh, uh, live uh, recording, right? It'll be uh, 
Scotty G, Funsters. Funsters, Mother, exactly. mother Funsters. Mother Funsters, yeah. <laughs> if you do, hence the divorce, I would think you do three dots right before the hence, right? Dot, yep. dot, dot, hence the divorce. I, yeah, oh yeah, my act, my, my piece of paper, yeah. When I, That'd be a good Yeah, because I, I lead into that with my um, my singing during sex uh, joke. Oh. Hence the divorce. Let's yeah, hear about that. that. Yeah, so, so like, when, when I, I talk about my family, then I lead into the marriage. I go, I married, having an Italian mother, I married an Italian girl, and... You know, I wasn't, you know, not the perfect husband, and I know I, you know, do things to drive her nuts, you know, like, like, when we were, you know, having sex, and we, you know, reached that, you know, about the orgasm, I tend to break into song. Now, that's just, this isn't a joke. This is, this is my bit, this is my bit. Oh, okay, so I'm yeah, saying, you really is, sing during sex, or no, this is the bit, okay. This is a bit, this is my bit, I, this, is a, this is how like, I get to the Let's just hints. pretend he really sings, that makes Yeah, it this better. is how I get to the hints of divorce, yeah. so I'm like, you know, so yeah, when we're about to reach that ultimate moment of satisfaction, I'm like, hit me with your best shot. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, and she hated it when the holidays rolled around, because I'm like, come, they told me. And I played Santa for over 30 years, so I'm like, yeah, she really hated when I go in for one of my Santa gigs because she'd run from the building screaming. She couldn't take one more. Here comes Santa Claus. Here comes uh. Santa Claus. <laughs> so hence the divorce. That's how I did it to the divorce. Here comes Santa. Yeah. That's an underutilized um, um, a porno demographic, I think, is Santa porn. Oh, I think it totally is underutilized, yeah. We need more Santa porn. If somebody, I'm, I don't do adult movies or anything. But uh, if I did, I would, uh, I would, I would probably want to want to do a, and then you just well, call it "Here Comes Santa Claus." I right? don't really watch adult movies anywhere either. But when I was younger, they were like, well, I, my my find you try to spice up the marriage. We might have watched a few, but the problem is when I was young, growing up, they, the the poor movies were spoofs of real movies. Like instead of nine to five, they had eight to four. Instead of Urban Cowboy, it was Urban Cowgirl. They would do they would you know do Star Wars instead of Star Wars. They would. Do spoofs of real movies? Yeah, Edward, which made it Edward funny. Penis Hands. Yeah, Edward Penis Hands. Yeah, make it kind of funny. <laughs> now it's just a whole bunch of just sex. I mean, give me a plot. You know, give the plot. Yeah, like give me something to follow along. You know, yeah. I, so, I can appreciate that. Yeah, everyone's just like into just get to, to get down. You know, the what's problem the, is our society has no patience. So everyone wants immediate instant gratification. gratification. Yeah, they're like here. Enter your search terms: uh, black plus Asian plus foot fetish plus yeah. pegging plus Milking table right. plus glory, and then and then you have like a customized video, yeah. you know. And, and again, that yeah, of course it desensitizes you, you know, yeah. like like the Robin Williams joke. You're is getting now, the payoff. You're getting the punchline without the joke, basically yeah. in porn. Because Rob, Robin Williams, Robin Williams joke from like 30 years ago is now real. He said, you know, my foreplay is breaks yourself, Bridget, <laughs> and that that's kind of what it is now. It's like no one wants foreplay, just get right to it, you know. You want to hear the most offensive thing I ever heard in a in a porn movie? Before? Oh, you yeah, go for it. Go for it. Um, and this is not offensive for the reasons that you'd think it'd be offensive. Um, but uh, this guy said, you know, like when somebody's about to like to, to segue on your ejaculation bit. Right. Uh, when someone's about to come, they usually say something. Oh, I'm about to oh, I'm about to come. I'm going to come. Like, it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward yeah. down the middle. Yeah. But this one guy in a porn, he goes right when he's about to finish, he goes, he goes or, or when he finishes, yeah. he's like, what a release. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I almost threw up in my mouth. Like to me, that was disgusting. That was gross. That yeah. was like way. Like if you're a woman, it's and like, this guy is like leaning over you, sweating in your eyeballs, and yeah, all of a sudden he's like, yeah. "What a release!" Like, I would, I would find a way to incarcerate that individual. Like yeah. that's put that, her clothes. She put her clothes and went home. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you want to see like, 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 like putting a hair dryer into a crotch, like. Yeah. How do you instantly dry a vagina is, is by saying, <laughs> well, I mean, I guess it's over by then anyway. But yeah. like, to me, that was like the most disgusting thing I've ever heard in a porn for some reason. Like, I know. Does that but make sense You remind sense me of all me? these lines, like uh, when you talk about the big Lebowski and the and the, the ass thing. Is, do you remember here the Rob Williams bit in the 80s? No. He talked about he had to give up drinking because he knew he had a problem when he woke up naked on the hood of his car one day with his keys in his ass. <laughs> That was a great line. And then you talk about that. He was trying to start himself up. Yeah, and then the hair dryer, the vagina you just mentioned. Reminds me of the movie Date Night with Tina Fey and Steve Carell. I haven't seen that one. Oh, my God. it's a cla- You have to see it. It's a classic. But in the outtakes at the end, what they do in the movie at the beginning, they're this old New Jersey couple. You know, not old, but like a middle-aged New Jersey couple that's like boring and the, the, the spices out of their life. And they sit there and they confabulate. They look at other couples in the restaurant 
and do their story. Oh, that's like, fun. Yeah, like, I've oh, they're that. on a first date, but he's married and she wants his, you know. But, but they did the outtakes at the end, and she, she's like imitating the woman at the table. She goes, yeah, Jeremy, I'm going to go home and look at my vagina with a hand mirror. And Steve Carell just like <laughs> spits out his drink in the outtake. I'm like, that should have been in the movie. That was like the best. It's like, grump, you ever see Grumpy Old Men? Uh, yeah, once. Okay, so uh, Burgess Meredith, the outtakes at the end when the um, Chuck, their neighbor, was going out with, um, oh, the redhead. She was a beautiful actress. Um, I can't remember her name. Isla Fisher. No, no, That's that was a beautiful the Wedding Crashers. Yeah, no, it was history. <laughs> That's yeah. just a beautiful redhead. Oh, that was Ann Margaret. Ann Margaret. So Chuck, the neighbor, got the date with Ann Margaret first, and Burgess Meredith, the dad's looking out the window, the two coming home, he goes, old Chuck's taking the skin boat to Tuna Town. <laughs> It's a great outtake. Why wasn't that in the movie? That was the best line, you know? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, taking the skin boat to Tuna, Tuna Town. Town. yeah. That should be your T-shirt. You should sell. I should make that a T-shirt. Your merch. I should, yeah. Taking the, Scotty G, taking the skin mm -hmm. boat to Tuna Town. Whee! Should Whee! I, like, should I get it? Is that copyrighted? I can see if it's copyrighted. <laughs> Is, it, is, is an onomatopoeia copyrighted? I don't can know. You, can you copyright an onomatopoeia? I don't know. Trademark lawyers, anybody listening? Who's well, I, I have a trademark lawyer. I'm going to have to ask him that. I'm have to you ask have him. a trademark lawyer. Yeah. Listen how this oh, is how I, wrote, I wrote a book. So I'm, I was trying, and I um, was trying to make, I got to get a copyright anyway. So I wrote a book, but it's in the editing phases. So you're going to see a Scotty G book out there, I hope soon. Well, that is, yeah, that will be available shortly, and Scotty G will keep you apprised. In the meantime, if you want to read my book until this guy is done editing. Yeah, you have a book. You I wrote a book one. called Everything Up to Now in 2011. It was the story of me moving from Florida after 23 years, uh, skateboarding in Florida, moving to California, and the culture shock and the creative influence and what California does to a personality. Um, and then it was during the kind of 2008, around that time, the dot-com bubble burst. It's kind of yep. like a time window between 99 and 2012, where it's kind of like, you know, the crumbling society, like the, the, the financial, you know, we don't realize it yet, but that was the beginning of the end. Right. And uh, so I think historically now, I think it's a good way of looking at what things were like in that time window with uh, the new technology influence and how the Internet social media started kind of taking over yep. so um you know if you go to your luciferian uh, amazon whatever corporate be a moths whatever that's my books available just paul cody c-o-t-e everything up to now did it stop in 2011 uh well it was print published in 2011 but it was like up until probably about 2010 okay. and then after that i did a second book uh, called everything after that of course okay and it's pretty much like so the sequel the sequels are yeah the sequel the sequel the regular book's like 300 pages so it's it's a tome how many words is that jeez oh i don't know how many words okay. good golly like i think i had a word count at the end and i don't remember how much well i know publishers want at least seventy two thousand. so mine well yeah. or 70 i have seventy two thousand words they want at least 70 well it's for a new book so but 300 pages yeah so mine on on papers like 97 so you had to have at least 7, well 000. yeah so words. i have uh and i formatted it like a manuscript like it's literally eight and a half by 11 gotcha as a book okay. so it's like forget about traveling and reading this book because it's a it's a tome it's a giant book but gotcha but okay. it's formatted that way so a publisher can look at it and go well i know what the a finished book will look like in whatever size or whatever how thick it will be like it's a way of a publisher looking at a manuscript format they can tell you what the finished book's going to look like gotcha so that was part of a sales technique towards but it makes it unwieldy right gotcha and then everything after that was basically like i don't know if you guys used myspace back in the day but no i use myspace uh well i use my own space right well but not your space my personal right. space right <laughs> but i used it I for, for blogs like i used okay. it as a diary basically i'd never written a diary so i basically copied and pasted like four years worth of diary entries of like what i did okay. that day and book ended in between all the inconsequential bullshit is a little bit of like little tomes of little nuggets of wisdom right right but but it, it's pretty much just kind of like procedural almost and it's like copy paste including what music i was listening to or what movie i was watching because you could add like currently listening to sunny day real estate or whatever like so right. it was just like a little piece of what i was doing in that final four years as a follow-up so eventually I'll, I'll i'll write some more but uh i think the next thing i'm gonna do is a comedy book but i want to nice. i want to make it look like you know those corny uh books from the 80s like big book of humor yeah big yeah book with big giant lettering i want to make humor it look for like, dummies yeah right i want to make it look like a, a, a thick like book of jokes but it'll just be right. like whatever my comedy stuff is just written well out. in fact that's my book is a lot of my book is all the practical jokes they played at work in the corporate years Ooh. which are i actually they're jokes and bits i don't do on stage anymore 
because I don't. If you know them, you, why would you buy the book? So I want people to buy the book, and then I'll start doing in my act again. Ah, I see. Okay, yeah. I was about to ask you. Like, give me an idea of a practical joke, but we got to sell books well, you, here. We I have no idea you one. I've got uh, a lot in there. Yeah. Okay, here's your teaser of a good yeah. practical. So joke. So one practical joke I did is uh, on March 31st one year, my son and I went to work, and uh, you know, the, like you have the computer mouse right there, right? You see the red light on the bottom yeah, of it. Yeah. So we went to work uh, where I worked, and my current and old teams, my son and I, on March 31st, put a post note over the red light on the bottom of the mouse computer mouse for 150 employees for April Fool's. <laughs> so the next morning they came and you move the mouse, it appears it's not working because the red light is yeah. supposed to move along the desk. The freaking laser's not yeah. making contact. The laser's not making contact. So it basically, they, but the problem was I thought my coworkers were smart enough, some of them were, were smart enough to turn the mouse over and see, oh, it's supposed to note, take it off and get to work. We're giving people too much uh, credit for that. Because most of them called the IT help desk at 8 o'clock in the morning. And my buddy Len thought they thought that all these computer mice had crashed. I get into work. I was a little bit late because I had to take my son to school late that day. I come and he's coming through the lobby with a grocery cart. Like you get it like, you know, Giant Eagle on tops and stuff. Wegmans, a grocery cart full of computer mice. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? He's like, everyone, all these mice are breaking. I have to go replace them. <laughs> I'm like, dude, no, just have them turn them over. There's a network-wide mouse yeah. problem. They actually changed the IT script, the help desk script because of that joke. So when people are calling and say, my mouse isn't working, they're like, turn, turn it, it over. over. You see the red light. Yeah. Turn it over, dipshit. That's, yeah. that's your v- new verbiage. <laughs> turn it over, dipshit. dipshit. Exactly. Yeah. So that's that's a worthy prank. That's like, you know, Jim uh, putting the, the, the uh, stapler in jello. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. a, that's an office related prank that I can I can relate to. Wow. Well, just to remind you guys one more time, uh, we are the Golden Age podcast. Um, well, we, the editorial we, you know, the royal we, we feel it's best that you are beheaded. <laughs> this is the Golden Age podcast. My name is PJ Cody. I am here live with Scotty G live. Whee! Live on record. Yeah. And um, we're just doing it to it. And um, we, um, we have a few more minutes left here. We're shooting for an hour and a half. I really want to try to slap that stop button exactly an hour and a half. So Let's do it. I'd like to, you know have some consistent parameters for the other human beings out here so uh, just to let you know uh we're still doing uh saturday nights is comedy as you are so please come out to the voodoo meet me under the clock at the boston store and we'll do open mic comedy uh through the summer uh, with only a few exceptions it's going to be pretty 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 near my dad just say pretty near pretty near pretty near every saturday night Exactly. And um, even if Pretty I'm near. unable to make it, your boy Scotty G will do his best to hold it down. I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, putting him in a corner. Nobody puts baby in the corner. No one puts baby in the corner. And Oh, uh, my dad did. My dad used to punish us, me and my two yeah. my stepbrothers, stepsister, and half-brother. Yeah. There were four of us when he wanted peace. I think he did this more as torture. I don't think we were being that bad, but he wanted peace and quiet, like to watch football on Sunday. He would play a game called, a punishment called Compass. Compass? Compass, like north, south, east, and west, the four points of the right. compass. There were four corners in the living room who make each one of us kids sit in the corner, facing the corner, until he told us. <laughs> and if we made a noise, we'd have to stay there longer. And he would just sit there and watch the whole Giants game while we're looking at the corner. Yeah, he would get time to play quiet. compass. Yeah, my play personal compass. name for it is get the fuck out of my sight. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. That was my dad, yeah. <laughs> But go on, sorry to interrupt. Go oh, on. Oh, there's nothing yeah. to interrupt here. That's yeah. we're here for Scotty G. We want to hear his stories, his <laughs> backgrounds. It's not about me for this episode. Uh, I've uh, extolled you with enough of my background. You know, I was homeschooled. You know, I came from very uh, non-traditional environment, so I like to say that I don't even know what I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I have no frame of reference. I know I know nothing. That's what I say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the band Operation Ivy once said, "All I know is that I don't know nothing." So uh you're talking about singing, and, and that's funny yeah. to me because, like, not a lot of comedians. I mean, there's some comedians that do com- that do comedy and do songs yeah. that they incorporate into their comedy. But Eddie Murphy does a little bit of singing. I yeah. think that that's, like, to me, that's a bigger, that's a risk. Take that, uh, take, that's a risk that not a lot of comedians Well, it's actually do. was the reverse. Here's what happened. I grew up, uh, so I was playing the drums since I was nine years old, right, okay? And we started a band in New Jersey, and the catch... With our band, it was a little bit of a lie, was we all taught ourselves to play our own instrument. Well, I had professional drum lessons, so I, I didn't teach myself, right? 
But the rest of the band, our guitar player Jody taught himself how to play guitar. Wow. The bass player Gus taught himself how to play keyboards and bass. Yeah. Okay, so our, our our catch, you know, for going and trying to get a gig or something was, hey, we taught ourselves how to play. Listen, how good we are, right? <laughs> and uh, but we had no singer, and we were in my college. They came to visit me at college one time in Pennsylvania, and we're sitting there drinking, you know, Silver Bullets, you know, one fifty one rum and cokes, Woo. and we're playing Iron Maiden, uh, Peace of Mind album. I love the Iron Maiden Peace of Mind album. And I was shout out to Bruce Dickinson, yeah, Bruce Dickinson flying right? over in his 747. Right. In fact, oh, drummer Nico McBrain, the old Iron Maiden drummer Nico McBrain. When my son's name is Nick, I used to call him Nico McBrain growing up. And he's like, Dad, why do you call me that? And I had to show him the album. That's my one of my favorite drummers. But anyway, we were sitting in my college dorm room, and, the, and the, we called it the fishbowl because my two college roommates and I drank way too much in college. <laughs> fishbowl. But we, we had, he had a fish tank. We did have a fish tank. Anyway, I was singing the Peace of Mind songs like Flight of Icarus and all these songs and, and Judy Gus's girlfriend says you should be the singer you have a great voice so that's what I'm, so I became the singer and we and then I I had no singing lessons and we taught Chuck who the fourth amigo wanted to be in the band I taught him a little bit how to play drums he became the drummer so now we really did all teach ourselves to play our own instrument but then July the fateful day July 31st 1986 I got in a bad car accident here and here I killed myself and same, not, I, mean, I didn't come, but I died. You died for a I minute. Died, and St. Vincent brought me back in the emergency room. You're the shout, shout out, out to St. Vincent. Vincent. <laughs> Scott, you would not be here today if it wasn't for St. Vincent. And um, but yeah, they I, uh, they brought me back. But the problem was in the car accident, my eyeglasses chopped my nose off my face. My nose here is three operations. Why are you Doctor, trying to cut off your nose to spite your face? Exactly, I did. I totally did. But Dr. Maloney was now in Naples, Florida, doing plastic surgery for old people to fix my nose. St. Vincent saved my life, and also my left ear. He uh, Maloney did three ear operations, all plastic bones. Um, I have a hearing loss in my left ear. I had, my nose was reconstructed. I became tone deaf, so I couldn't sing. So we, I, my band, oh, shit. waited for me for like ten months to have all these surgeries, and we went to a studio in Red Bank, New Jersey, and I think Bruce Springsteen used to record there when he was younger. I th I can't remember because I'm old, but we went to the studio in New Jersey. We wrote all our own music. And we went to record our music, do a demo album. Like you remember the old LPs, the four albums, right? And I go in there and I start, because I wrote the lyrics. They wrote the music. I wrote all the lyrics. I was a lyricist. We got, our theme song was Give It The Axe. I'm singing this song, uh, No Mercy and Give It The Axe. And all the engineers behind the glass are just looking at me like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> and Judy pulls me outside. What the hell happened to your voice? I couldn't sing anymore. You sound like David Lee Roth circa 1998 now. Yeah, I, yeah, I sounded awful, you know? <laughs> so they actually kicked me out, and they kicked Chuck out because he wasn't a good drummer. And they got... Uh, they said, the, get the Chuck out of here. Right, exactly. They get Ingo Marte, who was, I think, a backup drummer at that time for ACDC. So Ingo Marte took over his drummer, and I forget that he was so mad about being kicked out. I forgot who the singer's name was. And they made the demo without me. Uh, yeah, so but I still have the demo, but the band broke up, never went anywhere. So that's your your Pete Best story, right? Yes, my Pete Best story. But what happened was my son now is a musician. Besides being an art, a tar architect and designer, he acts and he sings and he plays violin and piano. He I did pay for him to have professional voice lessons. He has a great operatic voice. He's like an opera dude. Yeah. Um, and he said to me one day because I would sing in the house anyway. And my ex wife and my son are like, and my son's like, Dad, my ears are bleeding. You suck. You, you can't sing. You suck. But then he talked to his voice teacher about me and says, Dad, it doesn't matter you're deaf. Your ears are behind you. That's why the bands have the amp in front of them right. to hear it. You can sing. You're just technique sucks. I was always a natural singer. <laughs> I didn't know how to breathe right. I didn't know how to sing. So my son has given me voice lessons. So now I can sing again. But my point was, that's how I got into comedy because the band kicked me out and I missed being on stage. I went into, I used to be a singer. I what? You see how this whole story, you see yeah, how this whole podcast circle. just wrapped itself up, went full circle? Yeah. So the point is, I'm not really taking a risk as a singer. That was where I started. But now I'm just bringing my singing and comedy together. Now we're taking a risk. But that's why I said taking a risk. Singing seems like even bigger risk, but that's, yeah. that's beautiful the way we wrap this up. Yeah. Now, the way I would sing is, is I, unfortunately, I, I had a hard time taking it serious, so it just became comedy or goofy singing. Okay. And then uh, that hipster girl I was telling you about, that a 23-year-old yeah. I dated, she certain things were, were triggered her, and her roommate would help me trigger her. Like if, if I started doing an impression of, of uh, Goofy, Right. she'd start crying she'd run to her room and start crying like she couldn't help herself and like 
that maybe that was shitty to do, but like the roommate would be like, would would she'd feed me a sad song and I have to sing it in the voice of Goofy so that we right, could right, right. repel my yeah. girlfriend. No wonder she hated me, right? <laughs> so one day, one day, um, I was telling her I went to karaoke and I I did uh, I started a joke by the Bee Gees, right. like a pre disco Bee Gees yep, when they're yep. still emo, kind of like <laughs> Moody Blues. <laughs> And so all of a I sudden, I did the Bee Gees in my night with Scotty Jippa. Go, go on. And then the girl, she's like, "No, no, don't do it." I'm like, "I started a joke, yeah, <laughs> which started the whole world laughing." <laughs> what I didn't see, and I've got that song. I that the yeah. joke <laughs> was on me. <laughs> and then she'd run over and, and cry. And nice. you know, I guess I'm a <laughs> shitty boyfriend, huh? Hey, we're coming up to the edge of it. Okay, we got 30 seconds or 20 seconds left. Do you want to do this as a as a full? hour and a half I just mashed that button no you do the hour because maybe we should do another one like we have so much to talk about maybe we'll, we'll do another we're going to do a part two have me back it's, I'll come back yeah, yeah I'm going to do his opening act now so my name is PJ Cody that's Scotty G live Wee. I get to tell him the Wee story next time Wee. we're going to hear the Wee story so uh, yeah. just please uh, check for Scotty G live on all your socials look for uh, PJ check Cody check for PJ Cody on your socials come to the uh, the thing and um, yeah so yeah, Bella, our producer Bella is cutting us off right uh, Bell, Bell is saying it's it's time to wrap this up. We're at exactly an hour and a half. Yeah, she has to check her P-mail. So I'm going to tell you what we're going to do now is we're going to play our uh, out, outro. Let's see the outro. outro theme. Uh, it's going to be uh, exactly uh, where we were uh, previously. And then here's our outro music. All right, got to turn my speaker on in order to do that. We're living the trife life. We are speaker past the Speaker on. Bluetooth pairing. Bluetooth connected. Bluetooth, Bluetooth connected. connected. That's it, everybody. It's the Golden Age podcast with your venerable host, PJ Cody. We are outroing our intro song, showing true professional production values. We've extended past 1 hour 30. We might finish it at 1.31 just for shits and giggles. Thanks again for joining us at the Golden Age podcast. For Scotty G, I am PJ. Thanks for having me. Much love. Much love. Just remember, if you don't like it, you can go jump in the lake. Right, one more time, Scotty. If you don't like it, you can go, go jump, jump in the lake. Into the lake. Right, peace and blessings. I love you guys. I'm out. Peace out. Late.